it is always a great pleasure to present our work uh, before this distinguished uh, gathering. I'm so glad to be here uh, for this. Let me thank the organizers for this kind invitation. I chose to talk about affordable clean water uh, using advanced materials. And I'm so glad that I'm presenting this before a team of experts who work on diverse areas of water. The moment when one thinks about water, I am always reminded of this famous picture. So this is called the pale blue dot. This picture was taken on February 14th, 1990, when Apollo 1, which was sent to explore the solar system, went past Uranus and took a last picture of the solar system. In one part of that picture, the only thing that one could see was this dot, which is blue in color, and that is our planet, the Earth. This picture uh, of Voyager very clearly states how important water is. It is so precise, the amount of water on this planet is, of course, it is confined to our planet. That obviously means that it is finite. There is no water to come from elsewhere to help us. And there is no water going out as well. So this water is constant. That obviously means that one has to protect it. Water, in fact, is the most important inheritance of our planet. The way that we think about water, of course, water is uh, connected to every uh, activity that we do, everything around life. But in the context of uh, sustainable development, you see that every goal of sustainable development connect to water in one way or the other. Almost all the goals uh, connect to water. And that water is increasingly threatened, as everybody would, would know. But then what is the solution for that? The solution, at least in the context of clean water, I believe, is materials. And in fact, this is not the only time that materials uh, have come to our rescue. So if you look at this famous book, of uh, Jules Verne of uh, 1865, when he talked about going from the earth to the moon, he wrote about a rocket which could take people to the moon. The material that he eventually ended up with was aluminum, which was just discovered well, of course, discovered several years earlier, although it was not industrially produced in 1865. The production started only in 1878 or so. But the point is that he thought about a rocket which was made or could be made with the advanced material of the time, nearly, namely aluminum. So if you start looking at water, the challenges of water were addressed by advanced materials of the time, uh, right from Harappan civilization, which used carbon, uh, and a number of other materials. And today we use nanomaterials to address these challenges. And we call the kind of science aquinanotechnology, which involves the development of new adsorbents, new sensors, new catalysts, new phenomena, uh, new devices 
And today we have applications. But an important aspect of today's nanomaterials is that they're all atomically precise. Uh, when they are atomically precise, uh, it also means uh, that the atomic, the tools that are used to understand materials with atomic precision can be used uh, in these materials also. So what you see is a mass spectrum of an atomically precise cluster, a nanoparticle, and that is well-defined. So the synthesis of this material is well-defined. The chemistry of this material is well-defined, which can be studied with a number of techniques, such as mass spectrometry. Now, there are a number of other tools as well, uh, and you study this with great precision. Now, what have we done in the context of these materials? not just the previous material, a number of such nanomaterials that we have studied, which I will come to in the course of uh, this lecture. But what we have come to is that we, we produced these materials, we understood the chemistry, and we applied it uh, in the field. For example, in, in the first picture that you see here, we developed such materials in the form of a filter to remove arsenic from drinking water in an arsenic affected area in West Bengal. This is a picture taken from the district of Nadia, wherein a boy is pumping water from a cast iron, using a cast iron pump from a depth of about 80 feet or so. And the water that comes out, uh, if it is poured on the platforms, the cement platform, uh, the cemented uh, uh, structure that you see here, over a period of time, it gets stained with red color. That is because of iron oxide. In this particular region, if there is iron oxide present, it is also in, in the water. Uh, well, in the water, iron oxide is seen uh, on such a platform. It is clear that iron is present in the water and along with iron arsenic is present. In this region, the amount of arsenic in drinking water is six times the limit. But people have been drinking it because there is no affordable solution. So we put, it, put this solution there and with the same applied pressure, the water that goes through a filter and you get clean water confirming to all the quality standards, you get about, you can draw about 1000 liters of water every day for a typically a few, uh, few houses use such a pump. And this runs for several years together at this kind of arsenic concentration. And after that, the material has to be changed. Well, therefore it has been implemented uh, in schools uh, in the neighboring places. At the same time, it can be the same technology can be implemented in different ways. So this is a community treatment plant in another, uh, this, another uh, state of India uh, where this is implemented for a community. Typically a few hundred homes or maybe a few, a couple of thousands of uh, homes. So it is going from uh, a few hundred liters per day to a million liters per day kind of uh, treatment capacities. The basis of all these is advanced materials, as I mentioned. The kind of advanced material uh, used here is a biopolymer reinforced nanocomposite. The idea of creating such materials is to create sustainable materials, which are using sol water soluble ingredients in, the, in making these materials and the synthesis is made in water and there is no additional energy needed for creating such materials. And this material, uh, once it is prepared, it is water insoluble and you pour dirty water through that and you essentially get clean water. This is what we 
showed in this paper. Uh, the basis of this is biopolymers. In this paper, it is chitosan, but you can look at a range of biomaterials and deposit metal ions in the form of oxyhydroxides. So here, demonstration is aluminum oxide, oxyhydroxide. And this over a period of time with appropriate control of pH, you create aluminum oxyhydroxide flakes of a few nanometers in thickness, a few nanometers in width, and about 50 nanometers in length, sheets two-dimensionally represented like that. But this is a three-dimensional object. So you stack these sheets in three dimensions with a porosity inside, the pore is about 15, 15 nanometer big. So you can put nanoparticles inside and you can see such objects, such flakes and objects in transmission electron microscopy. You have soluble ingredients and finally you get insoluble composite and the water is standing above this. And this stands above that for years together. The material is having a Young's modulus comparable to river sand. So it is extremely good to say that from room temp at room temperature, you create a material at with soluble ingredients that create insoluble composite, uh, a process of synthesis uh, similar to that of seashells. And of course, this is synthesized in water. Therefore, there is some contamination of water in the course of the synthesis. But then the amount of water that you can produce is about 100 times to 1,000 times larger than the material, the water that has been contaminated. So it is an extremely water positive uh, synthetic protocol. So let us say if you put uh, nanoparticles and you put silver nanoparticles in it, for example, the benef benefits of silver that everybody knows releases silver ions. And silver ions are antimicrobial, so you can destroy bacteria when silver ions come out at a concentration about 35 ppb. So what comes out is around 50 ppb, about 40 ppb in this water, uh, when water is kept over this material. Now, this is a well-known fact that silver nanoparticles release silver ions. But what is so great about this is that in standard water or in, in field water conditions, the water that is there will, of course, uh, the silver ions, that concentration will gradually come down and the water will no more be antimicrobial. But in this particular case, as you can see, the silver ion concentration is, uh, is constant and water continues to be having antimicrobial uh, properties. Now, this experiment, as you can see, is done for 1,500 liters of water, but we run it up to 10,000 liters, you will see the same activity. This is because such nanopores do not, because the silver ion nanoparticles are embedded in nanopores, the scale forming entities in real water is silicate ions. They do not penetrate uh, onto uh, to these pores and deposit on the silver nanoparticle surfaces uh, in the kind of time scales that typically this happens. However, this happens over a long period of time. After a couple of years, you can uh, see scaling uh, occurring on the surfaces. So this is something great as far as antimicrobial activity is concerned. And therefore, the material becomes uh, bacteria dye, as you can see in these live or dead uh, staining experiments. The nanoparticles are embedded in the composite, as I told you. So as a result, when they are embedded in the composite, you don't see nanoparticles in, uh, uh, taken up by bio biological organisms. So if you deposit nanoparticles or release nanoparticles deliberately into E. coli, you can see them uh, by spectroscopy. But in your material, you don't see uh, any nanoparticles in the bacteria, although they are lysed now because the silver ion induced toxicity the, there is lysing that you see in the bacteria, but no nanotoxicity. Now, there are a range of materials. The kind of material that is shown here is iron oxyhydroxide, made similarly uh, with a tiny 
let's say about 2.8 to 3 uh, nanometer large uh, grain structures. And what's so great about this is that it can uptake both arsenite and arsenate ions. This is arsenite and this is arsenate ions on the surface of these nanostructures uh, with nearly equal kinetics and equal efficiency. So you can model a nanoparticle surface and you see how these nanostructures are uh, absorbing arsenate and arsenate ion and model that absorption capacity, design this material even with improved efficiency. So if you create such materials about 12 to 25 grams of this material, you put it into this cartridge and you pass 100 parts per billion of arsenite and 100 parts per billion of arsenate combined together, 200 parts per billion, what you get is two parts per billion of arsenic uh, in the output water, total arsenic uh, in the output water. It runs up to 1,200 liters. So that means the material has a large adsorption capacity in the field water conditions as shown here with water containing both arsenite, arsenate and iron and several others. You pass it through and you get this kind of uh, clean water. You test it in the field in the form of a, a field test in, in West Bengal. And we chose, we extended that uh, field studies to an entire district uh, shown here called Murshidabad. That district is shown here. Hundred such community plants were installed in, in these locations and they were all quite satisfied, giving satisfactory results. Then it was taken to a larger field application. So this is a field where uh, 200,000 liters of water is produced by this plant, which uses uh, standard adsorption media, including alumina. Now this area has been shrunk into a very small area because this materials, our materials have much larger capacities and very small adsorption towers. You get essentially the same kind of uh, volume, 180,000 liters uh, of water per day. That is 10 hour of uh, treatment conditions. That is the input concentration. This is the output concentration. It has been working even today uh, after seven, eight years of operation in the field. And so it can be expanded uh, and it has been expanded in this uh, kind of capacities. It can be expanded in community treatment plants, the 25 kiloliters to 1 million liters. So today these units are also monitored over the internet. So what's the cost of it? The cost of this is about this much, paisa per liter. So this is the kind of cost the US sends uh, here uh, with all water quality norms, are, are it, it meets all water quality norms. Today, these treatment plans are monitored over the internet with all kinds of sensors attached. Ultimately, it produces waste. So the kind of methodology uh, that we well follow in, this, in the field conditions is that although the material can be, uh, you know, it, it can be reactivated, we do not do that in the field because it again further contaminates water. And we do not want to take this material to the manufacturer's place and, and process it because that also contaminates the soil. The methodology we follow is, or the protocol we follow is to deposit it in the field itself because ultimately the arsenic came from that field and we do not want it to cause contamination elsewhere. So therefore we study this material's toxicity characteristic leaching and find that this material is safe for disposal Additional kind of protection uh, can also be taken, although the material is safe for disposal, if additional protection is needed, as per the state government's uh, requirement, it can be implemented as well. So here is a brief video of what we do in the field in a recent installation.
So as you can see, uh, this kind of implementations are now uh, going on in uh, different parts of the country. So one side it is arsenic free Punjab, it, it can also be arsenic free India. So this is the uh, mission with which we are now pursuing and it is being implemented across. So in one case, when there is arsenic in drinking water, we can remove it. But nanomaterials of very many different kinds exist and we work on many of them. One such example shown here is when there is no water at all, how can you use advanced nanomaterials for water harvesting? So this is uh, one such material that we created by electro spray of metal uh, ions and you create nano brushes. And these nano brushes are similar to grass and which can condense humidity on the surface if the temperature is below the dew point. And we create new surfaces where humidity condensation occurs and we create water purifiers right from 35 liters to 2000 uh, liters per day. But of course, this is active harvesting. You require power and the power is not, uh, of course, it is quite expensive. However, there is there's also advanced uh, nanomaterials that people have worked on and I don't work on these materials, but I work on related number of other materials where humidity absorption and release happens without ex the expenditure of electricity. In addition, in the country, we have plenty of regions where there is significant brackish water contamination. And this brackish uh, water can be desalinated water in the range of about 1000 ppm to about uh, 3000 to 4000 ppm of water uh, of salt content we uh, electro adsorb these on uh, surfaces with active materials on them and we create clean water and for which a, a company has been started the particular interest is uh, water in the coastal areas where there is significant seawater intrusion the water becomes uh, saline and this is of course a problem uh, globally and so we create water kiosks in different parts of the country, especially when uh, this treatment plants do not require too much of electricity and therefore it can be run on photovoltaics. Our contribution in this context has been creating new electrodes and new electrode materials which have large electro absorption and capacity. And these, we, we process them, we create electrodes and we create uh, devices. So in the past few minutes, what I showed you are advanced materials that are created, which will remove arsenic or heavy metals or fluoride or many others from drinking water, a range of materials, although I showed only one or two examples. Uh, but then there are also other uh, surfaces that we have for active humidity harvesting, as well as for uh, salt removal. But across the world, a large number of other uh, uh, projects are going on, such as uh, removal of, um, well, creating clean water using gas hydrates. Uh, one of our friends uh, in, in, in Singapore works on this project called hydrate-based desalination. Hydrate, of course, as you know, is, is a, a storehouse of energy because uh, gas hydrates uh, contain gases, which are fuels, uh, but then the hydrate by itself in the formation Although they are made in uh, seawater, typically made in, in seawater under the ocean bed, the hydrate itself doesn't contain salt. So when you remove uh, gas from the gas hydrates, what you get is uh, clean water. This can be used for um, uh, this is an interesting clean water opportunity. Many other activities happen, especially with creation of new sensors and new opportunities as a result of that. We miniaturize sensors. Uh, and then use them in devices uh, to detect clean water. For example, graphene-based uh, arsenic sensors are something that we worked on. So several such uh, devices exist in the laboratory, which can go down to very low concentrations with handheld uh, uh, devices of this kind. And when they are put across the country, you get water quality. And this water quality can be evaluated on a minute by minute basis and with which we create big data and that big data can be analyzed leading to hydroinformatics. Ultimately, all of these have to be taken to policy 
uh, this understanding of water quality, quantity, availability of water uh, data, water, water distribution of water, all of these have to be incorporated into a national policy so that there is an equitable distribution of water. Ultimately, in the past few minutes, I was telling you that our dreams become reality with materials. Ultimately, uh, this dream uh, of water producing energy and clean water simultaneously can also be a realistic dream with advanced materials. As you can see, water produces H2, and that H2, when it gets oxidized, it produces H2O. So you create water and energy simultaneously for mankind, the only input being sunlight. And to take such science forward, we have built the International Center for Clean Water, Anyone, anyone who is interested in uh, listening to this lecture is welcome to contact us and use the resources at International Center for Clean Water to come with an idea and build a company or products in the context of water. This is housed at the IIT Madras Research Park, in, uh, and this is the first university-owned research park in the country. And my science is done by my students, uh, my dear students who have built a large number of activities around uh, water. And some of them have also built a company. And today we call this uh, company supplying a technology called Amrit, anion and metal removal by Indian technology. A number of people have worked uh, on these uh, themes. And several organizations have also supported us in building our water technologies. Let me thank my institution, IIT Vitras, especially its former director, Professor Bhaskar Ramurthy, and the current director, Professor Kama Koti for giving everything that is needed to build water technologies for all. Thank you very much.